वासुदेवाय रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो टेन चैप्टर फर्स्ट एंड वर्स नंबर फोर्टी टू प्लीज रिपीट आफ्टर मी यतो यतो धावती दैवचोदित मनो विकारात्मक पंचसु गुणेशु माया रचितेशु देयसो प्रपद्यम सहते न चायते वॉट वॉट मीनिंग यता यता फ्रॉम वन प्लेस टू एनोदर और फ्रॉम वन पोजिशन टू एनोदर धावती स्पेकुलेट्स दैव चोदित इम्पेल्ड बाई एक्सीडेंट और डिलीवरेशन मना द माइंड विकार आत्मक चेंजिंग फ्रॉम वन टाइप ऑफ थिंकिंग फीलिंग एंड विलिंग टू एनोदर आप एट द एंड ही अपटेन्स पंचसु एट द टाइम ऑफ डेथ वेन द मेटेरियल बॉडी टर्न्स टोटली इन टू मैटर गुणेशु द माइंड नॉट बींग लिबरेटेड बिकम्स अटैच टू द मेटेरियल क्वालिटीज माया रचितेशु वेर द मेटेरियल इनर्जी क्रिएट्स अ सिमिलर बॉडी देही द स्पिरिट सोल हु एक्सेप्ट सच अ बॉडी असौ हि प्रपद्यम बींग सरंडर्ड टू सच अ कंडीशन सह विद तेना अ सिमिलर बॉडी जायते टेक्स बर्थ ट्रांसलेशन एंड पर्पट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस ए सी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी प्रभुपाद शिल प्रभुपाद की जय ट्रांसलेशन एट द टाइम ऑफ डेथ अकॉर्डिंग टू द थिंकिंग फीलिंग एंड विलिंग ऑफ द माइंड विच इज इन्वॉल्व इन फ्रूटिव एक्टिविटीज वन रिसीव अ पर्टिकुलर बॉडी इन अदर वर्ड्स द बॉडी डेवलप्स अकॉर्डिंग टू द एक्टिविटीज ऑफ द माइंड चेंजेस ऑफ बॉडी आर ड्यू टू द फ्लिकरिंग ऑफ द माइंड फॉर अदरवाइज द सोल कूड रिमेन इन इट्स ओरिजिनल स्पिरिचुअल बॉडी पर्पट one can very easily understand that the mind is constantly flickering changing in the quality of its thinking feeling and willing this is explained by arjuna in bhagavad gita chanchalam hi mana krishna pramathi balavadhradam tasya aham nigraham manye bayo eva sudushkaram the mind is chanchala flickering and it changes very strongly therefore arjuna admitted that controlling the mind is not at all possible this would be as difficult as controlling the wind for example if one were in a boat moving according to the wind on a river or the sea and the wind were uncontrollable the tilting boat would be very much disturbed and extremely difficult to control it might even capsize therefore in the bhava samudra the ocean of mental speculation and transmigration to different types of bodies one must first control the mind by regulative practice one can control the mind and this is the purpose of the yoga system abhyasa yoga yukte na but there is a chance of failure with the yoga system especially in this age of kali because the yoga system uses artificial means if the mind is engaged in bhakti yoga however by the grace of krishna one can very easily control it therefore sri chaitanya mahaprabhu has recommended hare nama hare nama hare nama eva kevalam one should chant the holy names of the lord constantly for the holy name of the lord is non different from hari the supreme person by chanting the hare krishna mantra constantly one can fix the mind on the lotus feet of krishna sabai mana krishna padara bindayo and in this way achieve the perfection of yoga otherwise the flickering mind will hover on the platform of mental speculation for sense enjoyment and one will have to transmigrate from one type of body to another because the mind is strained only in relation to the material elements or in other words to sense gratification which is false 
Maya Sukhaya Bharam Udvahato Bimudhan, rascals, Bimudhan, being controlled by mental speculation, make huge arrangements by which to enjoy life temporarily, but they must give up the body at the time of death, when everything is taken away by Krishna's external energy. At that time, whatever one has created in this life is lost, and one must automatically accept a new body by the force of material nature. In this life, one may have constructed a very tall skyscraper, but in the next life, because of one's mentality, one may have to accept a body like that of a cat, a dog, a tree, or perhaps a demigod. Thus the body is offered by the laws of material nature. Karanam gunasangusya sad asad yoni janmasu. The spirit soul takes birth in higher and lower species of life only because of his association with the three qualities of material nature. Urduam gachanti satvastha madhya tishtanti rajasa jaghanya gunabritistha adho gachanti tamasa. Those situated in the mode of goodness gradually go upward to the higher planets. Those in the mode of passion live on the earthly planets and those in the mode of ignorance go down to the hellish worlds. In conclusion, the Krishna consciousness movement offers the topmost welfare activity for human society. The Sena section of human society must therefore take this movement very seriously for the benefit of all humanity. To save oneself from the repetition of birth and death, one must purify his consciousness. Sarvopadi binir muktam tat paratvena nirmalam. One must be freed from all designations. I am American, I am Indian, I am this, I am that. And come to the platform of understanding that Krishna is the original master and we are his eternal servants. When the senses are purified and engaged in Krishna's service, one achieves the highest perfection. The Krishna consciousness movement is a movement of bhakti yoga. Bhairagya vidya is a bhakti yoga. By following the principles of this movement, one becomes dissociated from material mental concoctions and is established on the original platform of the eternal relationship between the living entity and the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his servant and master. Thus, in summary, is the purpose of the Krishna consciousness movement. Oma Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Anjana Salakaya Chakchur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mandeham Shri Guru Shri Utapadakamlam Shri Guru Vaishna Vamsa Shri Rupam Sagrazatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamsa Antayam Adrir Abala Haridasa Baryo Yad Rama Krishna Charana Sparsa Pramodaha Manam Tanoti Sahagos Ganayosta Yur Yat Paniya Suyavasha Kandara Kanda Mulay Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vashadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare At the time of death, according to the thinking, feeling, and willing of the mind, which is involved in fruitive activities, one receives a particular body. In other words, the body develops according to the activities of the mind. Changes of body are due to the flickering of the mind, for otherwise the soul could remain in its original spiritual body. So I am very fortunate to be present before you on this platform. and. Uh, <coughs> I've been asked to speak on this verse, which will definitely help me to purify myself. And I would also like to seek blessings of all the senior Vaishnavas who are present here. And it's a great privilege to be here sitting at the foothill of Giri Govardhan. And uh, though it is not a direct glorification of Sri Giri Govardhan, <laughs> but still it's anyway, a Krishna Katha is glorifying Krishna one day. So this is in one sense, of course, glorification of Govardhan also. So let's have a recap of what happened till now. <coughs> so once upon a time, Kamsa, not Kamsa, first Vasudev comes, who is getting married with Devaki. And then he mounted on his chariot to return to his home with his newlywed wife. And then Kamsa, he appeared on the scene 
and he out of affection for Devaki, he took the reins of the chariot in his hand and he became the chariot driver for the satisfaction, for the pleasure of his sister Devaki. And it is a festive moment. It's uh, everywhere, you know, there are hundreds of golden chariots, there are hundreds of elephants, at least 400 elephants were there, which were garlanded with uh, golden garlands. And there were uh, 10,000 horses, 1,800 chariots, and uh, 200 young, beautiful maidservants, which the father of Devaki gave her in dowry. And at the time of departure, many kinds of musical instruments were playing. For instance, uh, consoles, drums, kettle drums, bugles, they were all vibrating just to mark the auspiciousness of that event. And now everything was going on very nice. And uh, <coughs> everyone was happy, Kamsa was happy, Devaki was happy, and Basudev was also happy to have his new uh, bride. But suddenly then there was a heavenly voice, an unembodied voice addressed them and which said, Oh, Kamsa, you are a foolish rascal. You know that the eighth son of this lady it is going to kill you. And then as soon as this announcement was made, Kamsa, he lost all his affection for Devaki. Now Kamsa immediately, he, he, he caught hold of Devaki by her hair and from his right hand, he took out his sword and he was ready to severe the head of Devaki. Now, yeah, Kamsa was uh, famous for his wickedness. He was uh, famous for his sinful activities. And uh, it was expected of Kamsa. Then uh, Basudev, now what action he is going to take to, pre to stop Kamsa from killing his uh, new wife? Now, is he going to raise weapons against Kamsa? Definitely. Uh, he is uh, going to uh, use weapons, but it's not the gross weapons. It's the weapon of words from Shastra. Because Basudev has been described as Mahabhaga. Mahabhaga means he is an ocean of good qualities. So uh, he, he does not become angry with Kamsa actually. He tried to con convince uh, Kamsa by using knowledge and wisdom. Basudev thought that I should gradually uh, convince Kamsa, I should gradually awaken his affection for Devaki and uh, <coughs> by reasoning and I will and by using Sama like uh, our devotees are describing about what diplomatic principles Basudev used to convince Kamsa like Sama, Dana and Bheda these three principles was used by uh, this uh, Basudev and uh, Basudev said to Kamsa Oh, Kamsa, oh, my brother-in-law, you are the hero, you know, you are the hero of Bhoja dynasty. You are the pride of Bhoja dynasty and great uh, heroes like Jarasandha, they have praised your qualities. You know, how can a qualified person like you, he, he can kill a woman, you know, that too, his one sister. And that too, when she is going to get married. So it does not behoove you, it does not suit a warrior like you. To, create, to commit such a heinous act on this day. So, Sama, Dana, and Veda, I will speak a bit about this. Sama, what is Sama actually? Sama means it's uh, trying to pacify the other person with kind words, uh, invoking uh, relationships, and also glorifying his qualities. Like here, in this uh, particular verse, Basudev is saying that uh, you, you are the hero, you are the star of the Bhuja dynasty, and uh, many other great personalities have uh, uh, praised your qualities. So in this way, it's uh, like uh, trying to please Kamsa by glorifying his qualities. That is Sama actually. And then Dana. Dana means like uh, it's uh, trying to tell to the other person that she, if you will do this for me, then what you will get? That is Dana. So now Basudev is saying to Kamsa, like, see Kamsa, if today you want to kill the mother of your enemy, but, but she is a woman, defenseless woman, Avala Nari, and so if you don't kill her, then, you know, you'll be famous as a follower of Dharma. So that you will get, you know. 
that is your personal that will be your personal gain and then vasudev also uses bheda like it's a bheda means it's trying to uh, invoking uh, trying to invoke fear and doubt in the other person minds for the action which is going to commit like vasudev what did he say vasudev said that see come sir be careful ha huh? because according to vedic principles uh, a woman a brahmana a cow and a in an old man a child they are never to be killed under any circumstances you know and and who is devaki devaki is a defenseless woman and she is also a member of your one of your one family and on, on the top of that she is parastri she is wife of another another man so why do you want to implicate yourself in these sinful activities you are you will lose all your reputation as the king of hosa dynasty you know and uh, also you will get hell in your next life for committing such a heinous act so by uh, so showing kamsa how he will suffer in this life what problems will face in this life of disfamy of defame me and plus uh, what will happen in his next life uh, come uh, this vasudev is trying to persuade kamsa is trying to stop kamsa from killing devaki now one may question like okay but uh, why should kamsa hear vasudev you know kamsa you said that kamsa is a wicked person then why should a wicked person like kamsa he should hear to someone like vasudev <coughs> why should not he he kill devaki and uh, and in this way he stop his death which is to be happened on the by in the hands of the son of devaki so our acharyas have written that uh, even snakes and tigers you know even they do not attack or even they do not create obstacles on the path of those people who are endowed with good qualities and as we, i mentioned earlier vasudev he is an ocean of good qualities mahabhaga so that's why i which hope that kamsa will listen to vasudev and uh, <coughs> there there can be one more question like uh, vasudev it seems that vasudev is trying to is trying to stop kamsa from killing devaki and in this way he does not want to lose his object of enjoyment which is devaki is it so <laughs> does vasudev not want to lose his object of enjoyment it's not like that uh, again our acharyas have clarified this statement and actually vasudev he wanted to save kamsa from committing a sin otherwise vasudev he had full faith on the prophecy of the demigods that the eighth son of the the eighth child of devaki is going to kill kamsa he had full faith and it's he knew that nothing is going to happen to devaki but just in order to save kamsa he is trying to instruct kamsa in the next nine verses now <clears throat> he tried all means but he could not change the mind of kamsa so now vasudev is using logic see kamsa now you you are fearful that uh, uh, the child of this devaki is going to kill you right but, and then uh, you will you have to die but see death is certain for everyone anyway you know even if you don't if you kill devaki even if you kill devaki then uh, someone else will kill you it is inevitable na jayate mriyate va kadachi nayam bhutva bhavita va na bhoya right <coughs> so death is death is certain you cannot stop it by any means and uh, on the top of that you are a big warrior and a warrior like you you should not be afraid of death you know <coughs> so now uh, by speaking about death but sudev is trying to uh convince kamsa and then basudev further he also explains that see you want to maintain this body by killing devaki but uh, it would have been better to maintain the body if it were the last body but it's not like that you, anyway you are going to get next body also so why you are worrying no need to panic you know you'll get another body anyway and then he spoke this verse he spoke this verse that the body will be merged into five elements and then you will get another body like that 
So it would have been proper to maintain the body by committing sinful acts if it were the last birth. But it's not like that. So you don't need have to kill Devaki. And then he Basudev he gives examples, two examples to to explain to Kamsa about the transmigration of soul. The first example he gave uses a man is trying to walk, and while walking, what does the man do? He lifts his uh, back feet from the ground, and then he presses the right, right, the forefoot on the ground. That's how he walks. And then it might have been difficult to, for Kamsa to understand this logic. So uh, Vasudev used the second logic. He said, OK, Kamsa, let me give you another example. Have you seen a caterpillar? A caterpillar, what he does? It, uh, it only after withdrawing its hind limb, it places the forefeet on the grass, like that. You know? So this is how transmigration of soul takes place. So you don't have to worry about all these things. And then, anyway, if you, and when you will get another body, then you will forget everything about this body. Whatever you will do in this lifetime, when you will get another body, then you, don't, you won't remember anything at all. You see? You don't believe me, Kamsa? OK, again, let me give you an example. See, in dream also, when we imagine ourselves, to be king, or when we think ourselves to be king, or Indra, or personalities like this, then actually we forget the current body. We think that we are this uh, in the body of king. We don't remember our the current body. So why it is not possible to forget the past body? You see, so these are the logics that were used by intelligent Vasudeva to convince Kamsa. Now this has been discussed till now. Okay, I just gave a few brief review of what happened till now. And uh, <coughs> now Kamsa would have said, OK, that's all fine, whatever uh, pravachan, whatever instructions you gave regarding reincarnation and transmigration of soul. And uh, you also cited about the bravery of a warrior that, oh, you are uh, being the brother. How you can kill your sister? Brother is supposed to give up his life for the sake of his sister. And he wants to take away her life. It's not so favorable. And if you are a great warrior, then why don't you fight with the eighth child of Devaki? That would have been better. You know? Why are you showing this cowardice nature? So now comes to say, OK, it's all fine. But see, if in next life, if I won't become king, then what will happen? I won't get enjoyment. You know? I, won't, I can become happy. So now what do you say? Then Basudev is saying this statement. What is saying? Don't worry, Kamsa, you see. Your next body will depend on whatever you think, whatever you think, whatever you feel, whatever you will by your mind. It's all about your mind. Whatever will be the state of mind, you know, what will be the consciousness of your mind? In the next life, you will get that kind of body. So you just focus on controlling the mind, and that will solve everything. <laughs> you know, see how Vasudev is preaching to Kamsa. Now, <clears throat> so today, uh, it has been uh, the talk of mind control is going on. And Srila Prabhupada also speaks about how to control mind and what will happen if you will not control mind. And is it, so is it so easy to control mind or is it difficult to control mind? All these things has been explained by Prabhupada in the purport. So I'll also, uh, whatever time is remaining, I will try to give a, a brief uh, explanation on the topic of mind. <laughs> mind tattwa. <laughs> This is so complex, actually, because, see, I remember that devotees, they go to colleges and they try to give seminar on how to control mind, you know, as if they have controlled mind. Of course, <laughs> devotees' minds are controlled. That's for sure. So, <clears throat> and till now we are talking about how to control mind, right from that first seminar before coming to Krishna consciousness. And till now, we are still working on how to control our mind and uh, what to do with the mind, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, this will go on because we have got only one mind to train ourselves. Krishna has given us only one mind. There are no two minds. You can't just uh, delete the mind. Okay, I'll get another mind in my next life and I'll start afresh everything. It's not like that. You've got only one mind. You have been, we, have, we have been revolving in this material world for millions of lifetimes with the same mind. <laughs> This is the same mind which was there with us when we were either a worm, a grasshopper, a bird, a cat, a dog, whatever. 
So we've got one, only, only, only one mind. So we have to train ourselves, train the mind. What should we train? How to train the mind? All these things I will try to, as far as my understanding goes, I'll try to explain here before you exalted Vaishnavas. So okay, mind control. So what is mind control actually? Or, or let's say what is mind? So it's a basic definition. Uh, like whatever we can see now, this is the gross body. And inside the gross body, the gross body is made up of five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, lumir, apono, vayu, khammano, buddhi, revasa. And then inside the gross body, there is a subtle body. Mind, intelligence, and false ego. This is known only by the devotees. Of course, we cannot expect the scientists and the modern scholars, mundane scholars to know all these things. This is the knowledge uh, from Shastra that we have a subtle body also, which includes mind, intelligence, and false ego. And then inside this subtle body, there is a soul. Like as we all know, this example is often given, like a person is wearing a shirt, and on top of that, he's wearing a coat. So the coat can be compared with uh, the gross body, the shirt can be compared with the subtle body, and the Based banyan, it can be compared with soul. <laughs> so mind, and also our acharyas uh, try to explain what is the relationship with uh, amongst mind, intelligence, senses, soul by giving this example of a chariot. This is all, not new things for all of us. We have already read and uh, heard about this chariot of mind, intelligence, and soul. So in the chariot, basically, what happens? There are five forces. The five forces are compared to senses. And then the passenger in the chariot is compared to the soul. The chariot driver who is driving the chariot is compared to the intelligence and the driving instrument, the reins of the chariot, which controls the horses. That is compared to the mind. So here we comes the mind. What is the mind? Mind is that driving instrument of the chariot. See, it's all, it, everything depends on the mind. If the, if, you, if the intelligence is not strong, if the chariot driver is not very strong, then it may lose the reins from his hands. The ropes, if you lose the ropes from his hands, then what will happen to the senses? The senses will go ahead and there. The chariot, the chariot driver will lose control of the chariot and the chariot may turn upside down. It might create havoc. So the mind has to be controlled. That is the idea. So the intelligence has to be very strong in order to control the mind. You see? So how can the intelligence be strengthened? The intelligence can be strengthened by diverting it to Vedic scriptures. If we divert our intelligence to reading Vedic literatures like Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, then our intelligence can be strong enough to control the mind. That is one way, of course. Now, <clears throat> like Prabhupada, as he uh, pointed out, points out here, like mind is chanchala, flickering, flickering nature of mind. Why the mind is flickering? Because <clears throat> the mind is always thinking, it's always feeling something, and it's always willing. What should it do next? How should it gratify the senses? So this is the function of the mind. The mind is the reservoir of all the thoughts and all the memories also. That is the mind. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, let me give one more example how the mind acts. Like when we are walking on the street and suppose if we see a gulab jamun, you know, then the senses, they will, you know, they will convey the message. I like we see from through eyes. Then the eyes will convey the message, what it sees to the mind. And the mind will see, oh, okay, it's gulab jamun. Okay, let me check what is, what is in the store for gulab jamun. Have I got any memory for gulab jamun or not? And then it will check its memory. And it will say, oh yeah, previously it was tested. And it's quite sweet in taste. Then the intelligence of this mind, it will transfer this information to the intelligence. Okay, now what I should do? And then the intelligence will decide, decision making. That is done by the intelligence. What is good? What is bad? What is right? What is wrong? What is in accordance with sastras and what is not in accordance with sastras? That is the function of the intelligence. So then the intelligence will decide, okay, grab someone, it's good. Yeah, 
you will have some sense gratification. Yeah, go, go for it. Okay. And then the mind will convey this information to the working senses. And then the working senses, what it will do? The hands, it will immediately go inside the pocket, take out the money and pay for it. And then you can put the gulab jamun into your mouth. See? So mind, mind is the center, you see. That is the whole idea I'm trying to explain here. So it is said that, like just the example of a palm is given. You know, the mind is in the center and the senses are around it. <laughs> like that. So if you control the mind, then you can control the senses also. That's the idea. So, <clears throat> Arjun said, Chanchalam hi mana krishna pramathi balavadhidam tasyaham nigraham manne bayo riva sudhuskaram. It was not so easy for Arjuna to control mind. You know, a warrior like Arjuna, who is also uh, famous for his great devotion towards Krishna, uh, great, is a great sadhu, but still he finds it difficult to control the mind. So why we are talking about mind control at all? <laughs> because we have no other option. <laughs> we must talk about it. And we must try, we must endeavor to control the mind again and again. That's what Krishna said. By practice, you can control the mind, Arjuna. Don't worry. And how difficult it is to control the mind? Let's imagine, and this example is given, like suppose there is a boat going in the ocean. It is being controlled solely by the wind. You know, There are not oars to control the boat. It's controlled by, the, it's driven by the wind, suppose. And now all of a sudden the storm comes. Then can you control the boat? <laughs> you cannot control the boat because it, it was never under your control actually. It was already in the control of the wind. And now you, in the storm, you cannot control the boat. Then the boat will, what will happen? The boat will, again, topple over. So in the same way, as you cannot control a boat in the ocean in a storm, in the same way, you cannot control this mind in this ocean of mental speculation and transmigration of bodies. So that is the idea. <coughs> and... Uh, let me check my notes. <laughs> yeah. No one may say, okay, if my intelligence is intelligent, uh, if my intelligence is strong, then I can control the mind, right? Is it? Is it so? But mind is so powerful that also it even overcomes the intelligence. You see. Okay, all right, if you have a medicine to control some infection, that's all right. But sometimes the acute infection, it surpasses even the efficacy of medicine. You see, sometimes it happens. So just by having a strong intelligence, that will also not work. So now what to do? Yoga, should we try yoga? That is often recommended nowadays, that by yoga you can, by meditation, you can control your mind, you can control your senses, you can have peace of mind. Peace of mind means what? You can control your mind, right? <laughs> so you can have peace of mind. Just do control uh, this yoga. Whatever is going on in the name of yoga nowadays. Of course, this is not yoga which is being talked by Bhagavad Gita. This is all some physical gymnastics. And these all these so-called spiritualists, they are fooling the people, the mundane people. In the name of yoga, in the name of spirituality. Yoga is not spirituality. It's uh, just meant for uh, giving us material benefits. Like you can have some good physical health. And also, to some extent, you can have peace of mind also. <laughs> so that is a function of yoga. So, so is it possible to perform yoga in this Kali Yuga? It's not possible. We know that we cannot go to a secluded place in a forest. We cannot even sleep alone at night. <laughs> in a, imagine a single building. There's a big building, three-storied building, and you are asked to sleep there. And for me, it's very difficult. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep in that building, of course. So, and now you want to, now it is being recommended here to go to forest, go in seclusion, man, and then you arrange for some seats, you know, some elevated seats and this and that, and you close your eyes and you just try to concentrate on the, that supreme light or whatever. It's not possible. It's not possible at all. In the, especially in the current, in the current age, that's why Royal Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us the process of uh, Harinam. Like just by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra, everything will happen. And even if you can control even the mind also. <laughs> Not just control the mind, but you can do so many other things. You can achieve the ultimate perfection. 
मंत्राय मंत्र स्त्रायते इति मंत्र मंत्र मीन स्वर इट डेलीवर्स द माइंड डेलीवर्स द माइंड मीन्स स्वर इट कंट्रोल्स द माइंड डैस द फंक्शन ऑफ मंत्र एंड वी ऑलरेडी है महामंत्र हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो वाई डोंट वी चैंड हरे कृष्ण महामंत्र रिपीटेडली एंड इन दिस वे फूल द माइंड ओवर पावल द माइंड सो योगा ऑल्सो फेल्स नाउ ओके There is also one historical example how yoga fails. Vishwamitra, what was Vishwamitra doing? He was practicing severe penance and austerity. He was trying to control his mind using all his yogic pow yogic powers and all the rules and regulations of a yoga practice. But what happened? Was he able to control his mind? No. <laughs> Just this uh, Minka came, and he, he and it is said that just by hearing the tingling of her ankle bells he was attracted you know he was distracted and he engaged with uh, loving a pair with manika and then all his mind control was finished in a moment so that's what happened with uh, biswamitra many great great sages great great transcendentalist right from the beginning of this uh, uh, creation they are trying to control the mind <laughs> but see there are very rare few examples who succeeded in controlling the mind by such yogic practices so now how to control the mind that is the biggest question right so okay as i said earlier that chant chant hari krishna chant hari krishna and then you can control the mind and in the purport also sila prabhupad writes hari nama hari nama you kevalam you have chanted that verse so chanting is one method and then we can divert our mind to vedic literatures stories of mahabharat and bhagavatam and uh, that is another method of controlling the mind and also we should always engage the mind in thinking of krishna thinking of krishna his past times his lotus feet that is the very powerful method of controlling the mind and what is samadhi actually samadhi means is concentration on the supreme concentration of mind on the supreme that is samadhi you know so how this samadhi can state can be achieved it can be attained by refraining from sense objects you know you you, you should refrain your mind from unnecessary thinking about sense objects that's how we can satisfy the mind prabhupada wrote right somewhere in one of his books like if you want to satisfy your mind then just withdraw the mind from all the sense objects it will be satisfied and the more you think about the sense objects the more you think about gratifying your senses the more the mind will be dissatisfied see how the mind works so <clears throat> to refrain our mind from sense objects the first uh, so the first uh, uh, solution is that you don't you should not see the sense objects right because once you see the sense objects the senses will pass the information to the mind and the mind will start again speculating contemplating thinking willing whatever you see and then the problems will start so you should not see the sense objects but now what is happening in the modern scenario in the modern world this actually the whole modern civilization is set up in such a way to divert the mind to sense objects isn't it everywhere you can see allurements in the form of so many things you know and men the mind especially in city life when you are in city life and you when you see all these allurements while uh, driving your car or, or, or while uh, sitting on a bus you are going while traveling on the uh, roads sides as big banners then uh, how will you be able to think of krishna at all you see then you are thinking of about those sense objects your thinking power is being misused by all these things that's why it is recommended that you go to a secluded place secluded place means it's not been recommended to go away from the association of devotees we be in association of devotees but in a secluded place that is the whole idea of farm communities actually when you are in farm away from the city in seclusion then you don't have to see all these naked girls you know on the street <laughs> you don't have to see all these lusty people roaming around you will be in close association with nature with cows with devotees and then your consciousness will be uplifted 
It will be sattvic atmosphere. In sattvic atmosphere, it's easy to control the mind. But in this tamasic, uh, it's even below than the tamasic level, the city life. Now, why do you want to control the mind in city life? Now, you are sitting in a, in a place and you are being offered a variety of sweets around you. And now someone is asking you to control your mind now. Can you control it? Come on, are you joking? You are in the city life and you are being surrounded with all these allurements, various kinds of allurements. And now we are, we are asking you, now you control your mind. How will you control? It's not possible. You joke. It's a big joke. That is the idea of farm communities. You have to go to farm and you will be automatically, you don't have to see all these things. And then the mind will automatically in the sattvic atmosphere by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra. That is the goal of life, right? You want to chant Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And the quality, and most of the devotees have shared their experience that when they are in farm, then the quality of chanting has been increased many folds. So if you want to increase the quality of chanting, then why don't you go to farms? What is the purpose of life, in fact? Purpose of life is to please Krishna. And how Krishna will be pleased? By chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So, <clears throat> anyway, we don't have much time to discuss about farm now. But... This is very important. This plays a pivotal role in controlling the mind. As we can all understand, it's a common sense actually. It's, it does not require big elaboration here. So that is one way to engage our mind always in the lotus feet of Krishna, always in thinking about Krishna. And just by thinking about Krishna always, and by always engaging our mind in the lotus feet of Krishna, what will happen? Then... <clears throat> At the time of death, you will leave your body thinking of Krishna. That is the benefit, you see. That is the award. Right? <clears throat> so this is being explained by Srila Prabhupada here. That, uh, see, if you uh, control the mind, then it becomes easy to follow the instructions, the orders of our superior. Right? We want to carry out the orders of our spiritual masters, senior devotees, the orders of sastras. But if your mind is not controlled, then how you are going to carry out those orders? If your mind is an unconcord enemy, if as long as your mind is unconcord, then the mind will be distracted to uh, many kinds of, uh, you know, lust, anger, greed, avarice. It will not be uh, thinking about Krishna. And then when it will be diverted to so many things, then how will you engage your mind in carrying out the orders of your superiors? It becomes difficult. So this example is given by Acharyas, like just like a, a caterpillar, uh, by always thinking about how it, by thinking about butterfly, in the same life it transforms into butterfly. In the same way, every time by thinking of Krishna, that is the sum and essence of all Vedic literature, right? Think always of Krishna and never forget him. So that is the sum and substance of all the Vedas. So by always thinking of Krishna, then what will happen? Then we'll also, we can also gain the same bodily constitution as of Krishna. So that is the benefit. Okay, now I am running out of time here. So I will conclude basically. So... <clears throat> Okay, okay, I have other points also to make here, but I don't have time. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.